How are you all doing this morning? Yeah. Good. How about you? Well, I'm doing good. Excellent. I'm doing good. He was your first first person. Yes. Do what? You were here. You were the first person here, right? This morning. First person here. <laughs> first in. to show up in class. First to show up. I hope so. <laughs> That's what I try to do. Someone once told me, if you have to be anything, you might as well be early, right? <laughs> Plus, I don't know how much the traffic would be uh, an issue. I wish some other life. people followed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, kids. Um, so, what we're going to do today is talk about turf, and I want to keep this somewhat informal and do some kind of Q and A to go through this, but just kind of address some of the common uh, questions, misperceptions, uh, complaints, etc. That uh, you hear, I hear, you may hear, you, you think. Uh, today, and I might hit a little bit on disease, but I'll probably, you know, try to glance over that because Lee Butler will talk to you a lot about disease, and not only disease, but diagnostic of problems, because he runs the disease diagnostic lab at NC State, very, very good person just to evaluate her conditions, and uh, so even though you don't get Jim Kearns, Lee is uh, equally good. I know several of you, several of you brought your, uh, can I borrow this second? Yes. Your landscape gardener handbook, uh, chapter nine is turf grass. It's the one you you've skipped over much of time. <laughs> not, not this yeah. week. We had to read it this week. Yeah. You had to read it. Yeah. 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 I will we tell you. Do what? We actually did. <laughs> read it. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I know Ashley knows the story, but and, and I hate to kind of complain a little bit. But we put the chapter together several years ago, and in the process, I asked them about pictures. Oh, we got pictures taken care of. And then when it came out, I was a little horrified at a few of the pictures that they gathered, because I did not provide them any, because they were wrong. Um, so there was a change that had kind of a, I don't know, 1.2 edition or something. I'm not sure what they called it. Maybe it is a second edition. And they did change a few of the pictures, so I did provide some corrections. Ashley tells me they're not a big deal. She would not have noticed them had not I pointed them out. So I don't think you'll notice them either. I think two versions. They're so. not that dramatic. <laughs> they're dramatic, they're dramatic to me. <laughs> <laughs> and understand, I am a little bit unusual in, in multiple ways. And actually, I was just thinking when I came in here that, you know, redheads are about 2% of the U.S.'s population. And we have three of them at least in here. So that's kind of <laughs> Fake, fake, yeah. fake or real, you know, mine is real, uh, but yeah, you don't see too many redheads. Uh, so anyway, believe me, I understand the fact that the average person, the average master gardener, probably does not like turf as much as they like other plants in the landscape. I recognize that, so you will not, you will not offend me by talking bad about turf, because I've heard it all probably just about. I've been doing this now almost 25 years, so uh, I, have a, I have a few rodeos behind me on dealing with uh, people who don't like turf. Um, but the reality of it is, is turf is a component of the landscape, and in some landscapes it's a large component. Uh, it's a labor-intensive component uh, for some. Uh, it's, it's a source of exercise for some. Uh, you know, People say that the only exercise they often get sometimes is mowing the yard, and a lot of people today don't mow their yards anymore. I was actually listening to NPR a couple of weeks ago, and they said in a, in a U.S. poll, uh, what is the most common way people get exercise today in their response to this poll? What do you think it was? Walking the dog. Walking the dog. Number one way people get exercise today is walking the dog. I don't even have a dog, so uh, I do mow my grass, though. But mowing your, your grass is a good way to get in your steps. It is. Just your count steps. It is, and I enjoy Yep, oh yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I try to get to 12 to 15 a day, 1,000. Uh, so I have a series of questions, and then I'll follow up with some of these with some pictures to, to reinforce some of these questions and things like that. Uh, but these kind of... Uh, orientated or, or kind of came to light in the fact that I was putting some things together for some agent training a few years ago. And I was just kind of going through, and when somebody calls me, I have a notepad next to my phone, I usually write their name down and, and the date and often their question. Uh, I look back through those, you see a lot of the same questions. Also, if you've gone on to Turf Files, 
and uh, and ask the expert or ask a question on that. I actually ask the expert now is turning into something different, but there is a ask the the, the the page that comes into my inbox, so I answer a lot of those questions as well. Uh, but these are in no certain order, even though I try to group them by like grass selection and then problems and other issues. But best tall fescue cultivar, and it's interesting that a non plant person a lot of times does not realize that there are multiple cultivars of even grasses. I mean, a lot of people you all realize that in your, your trees and your shrubs uh, that you go to the nursery and buy, but grasses have a lot of cultivars as well. And we do put out recommended cultivar lists for the cool season grasses, so the fescue and the bluegrass uh, in particular. Uh, and one thing you may not realize, I mean, this predates me at NC State, but my predecessor and myself, we've looked at now, that, that number is closer to 800 now, different tall fescue cultivars. Uh, so there are a lot of cultivars out there. But here's the take home message to this question. And you're gonna kind of scratch your head when I say this, but this is true. And it's only true for tall fescue. The conditions on which a person puts the grass, the, the climate conditions, microclimate, shade, sun, uh, moisture, etc., cetera, uh, will play a bigger role in how that fescue performs than the cultivar will. Makes sense. So another way of thinking about that is don't get too bent out of shape about cultivars or tall fescue. When you're talking turf type, now we, we do have forage type and we have turf types. And unfortunately, one of the most common cultivars that's sold in our, our retail outlets is Kentucky 31 or K31, a lot of people call it. And K31 is actually a forage type. Uh, it's been around a long time. Uh, it used to have very high production. It could produce a lot of biomass, maybe harvest it and sell seed pretty inexpensively. Uh, so that is a little bit different story. But of the turf types, which are mostly what's sold you know, in our stores, the cultivar does not play a huge role in how it's going to perform. It's the people and the environment that's going to play a bigger role. And I'm not going to say that about any other grass, because the other grasses cultivar can make a huge difference. It's just the genetics are so similar to tall fescue that it will not. Would it be correct to say that a mixed cultivar? Yeah, well, generally, in almost every instance, it's cultivar, uh, excuse me, cultivar, tall fescue are sold as a blend. So it's a blend of multiple cultivars, usually three, sometimes four, occasionally two. We test them singularly. When we run our trial, we only have one cultivar, you know, that we test at a time. But, but yeah, when you're buying them out of the consumer, they're gonna generally be blended. And that's just trying to maximize some diversity in the bag. It's also a little bit of economics. You know, they may mix some higher producing cultivars with some they do not have as much left at the end of the seed conference, et cetera. Uh, but generally they're gonna be Blended. Now, a blend is multiple cultivars of tall fescue. A mixture is multiple species. So, if you're buying, like, they may call it a shade blend, but it's usually a shade mixture. It may have tall fescue in it, fine fescue, which we'll talk about. Uh, may have ryegrass in it, may have some other things. But usually, it's got a fine fescue component to give it a little more shade tolerance. But that would actually be a mixture. The, the, the species were overwhelmed the issues with the you know, cultivars and things like that. Uh, so when people call you to say, well, there's, there's some recommended cultivar lists on NC State's website, and we have those, and we do separate them out, but it's always funny if you look at our test plots, particularly if you look at them right now, you go out there and you say, oh yeah, there's 116 grasses out here right now. And people say, it looks like there's two. You know, <laughs> you'll see the lighter color of the Kentucky 31 and there's everything else. Uh, and they don't look very different. There are subtle differences, but generally they're not going to manifest themselves in a landscape that would cause much concern. Now, when you get to something like the zoysia grasses, and I, have, I think I have a slide later on that actually lists zoysia grass cultivars, uh, it is a little different. We have some, and I hate these terms because they're relative terms and they really are not very descriptive. <laughs> what we actually see. But we have fine textured zoysia grasses and we have coarse textured zoysia grasses. Now the coarse textured ones are about the same texture as a tall fescue, so they're not that coarse. So that term often leads people to believe that it's just going to be, you know, 
like St. Augustine or crabgrass kind of fish, uh, but it's not. Uh, the fine textures are almost wiry. I mean, they're very, very fine uh, in, in some cases. So the difference between the fine and the coarse textures will largely be personal preference, what the homeowner may want or what you may want, and who that person is selecting it. Uh, the fine texture ones generally do have a little bit better shade tolerance, but the coarse textured ones uh, generally are a little bit more user friendly, easier to maintain in the landscape or lawn. So I generally recommend people look more at the, the coarse textured ones than the fine textured ones, even though you can be very successful with either. Uh, I like to follow tall fescue with zoysia grass because in this area of the state, the Piedmont area of the state, We've seen a pretty quick shift from tall fescue to warm season grasses. And the two that are generally selected in this area are zoysia or Bermuda. Now Bermuda needs no trees around it. I mean, it needs to be open. And a lot of our new subdivisions that they bulldozed everything, now building a house, putting in a lawn, putting in two token trees in the landscape. <laughs> Those will do fine for a few years where that tree starts getting big and it starts getting shade and that Bermuda grass is gonna suffer. So the premium landscape, warm season grass is zoysia grass. So those are often the two that people are trying to decide between. Do I go warm, go zoysia, do I go cool and go tall fescue, fescue and blue grass? I, let me take her question okay, sure. first. Um, so I did a, a, some research on zoysia grass before I put that in a few years ago. And one of the things that they talked about was that there were newer cultivars, uh, <laughs> i.e. that come out in the last few years. years. That, yeah, that were more uh, tolerant and flexible, grass-wise and shade-wise. Is that, or, is that, I mean, they talked about that sort of older cultivars versus the newer cultivars. Uh, yeah, you know, the cultivar yeah. development of zoysia grass has been over a long period of time, and the change has been very slow, it has been very gradual. There hasn't been any leaps and bounds increases in zoysia yet. We have a couple of new ones coming out in the next few years, actually one coming out this year, uh, Innovation, uh, which I think is going to be interesting to look at. Uh, but still, zoysia grasses, incrementally, there's not a ton of difference from some of the old ones. Disease tolerance is actually one of the best benefits of some of the new ones, even if the old ones. Um, but drought. I, and that might have been what it was. I, I apologize. I can't remember. No, that's fine. But drought is it's it's been marginal. Yeah. And, and we could talk all day about this stuff. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll, have to, I'll have to ratchet it back every once in a while because I think of things as you ask questions. But uh, I mean, zoysia grasses. A lot of people are under the assumption, wow, I'll put this in my yard, it'll be green year-round, like my tall fescue, it's not going to happen. It will actually go brown quicker than almost anything, and it's also slow coming out. <laughs> if you drive around the neighborhoods right now and you see a, a Bermuda next to a Zoysia, the Bermuda's already green, and Zoysia's still very brown. <laughs> They're usually Just about two weeks behind the Bermuda, so they are slow to come up. That's a protection mechanism. If you think back last year, uh, in March, we had a really hard freeze in late March, snow in late March, and some of the earlier greening grasses got nailed last year. And those that greened up slower shrugged it off. It's not a big deal. Um, we have golf courses that, that and, and Duke University on their athletic fields lost acres of, of grass that had greened up early, and then it got, got hammered. Georgia is a slower one. That's part of its protection mechanism. It is more cold tolerant than Bermuda. Um, <laughs> before I before I answer this question, I want I want to do comment because I get this question a lot. I visit a lot of lawns and look at lawns and, and, and deal with this one on one. Um, if you have shade problems in your yard from your trees or neighbors' trees or your house, whatever it might be, and you're struggling with tall fescue because of shade. You're going to have an even worse situation when you go to a warm season grass. And that's really hard for some people to, to, to get a grip on. Because they want to save water and use a species uh, that's more uh, efficient water wise, more drought tolerant. And the warm seasons are definitely that category. 
So they'll put a warm season in grass, but the limiting factor of that landscape may not be the drought, it's the shade. And then you stick something that needs more sun than tall fescue needs, and then eventually it's gonna thin out on you. And that's, that's probably the number one issue when I visit on the landscape that I see is shade issues. And, um, and if you put sod in a, in a landscape, it doesn't matter if it's zoysia sod or muta sod or tall fescue sod, you have a honeymoon period where that, that grass will live off the reserves from the sod farm and will do pretty good. But if it's too shady, it's gonna eventually start thinning. And then you start seeing algae and moths and all these other things start coming in, weeds, et cetera. So certainly when you're trying to help someone decide what the best grass are along a landscape, um, I mean, shade is often a overarching issue. I actually have a brand new subdivision going in right in front of my house. I need to sneak over there one day and take a picture. <laughs> the people are buying the houses so quick, I'll probably make somebody mad that's going to be taking a picture of their lawn. Uh, but they're putting Bermuda grass in all these lawns in these houses. I, I think literally in some of them, I could probably almost touch yeah. Hi, neighbor. You know, two of those with my arms stretched out. And they have Bermuda in between. I mean, how much sunlight is that Bermuda going to get? It might get 10 minutes in the middle of the summertime. I mean, it's, not, it's going to get virtually numb. Uh, it's going to be bare ground in a year. I could guarantee it's going to be bare ground in a year. They should have just went ahead and put mulch in that area uh, and, and be done with it. So, whole other story. Um, the best Georgia grass cultivars, I have a few slides later, we'll, we'll try to talk about those. Uh, lots of trees, grass not so much. I have another slide on that. I'll be the first to tell people. Uh, in this lawn, grass is not your friend. I mean, grass is going to be a problem. And one of the first things I often do is, you know, I walk to this beautiful oak tree or whatever kind of tree it is. I start, I'm standing underneath the drip line of this tree. You shouldn't really have any turf in here in the trunk. You know, because that, that's the first spot you need to start getting rid of the turf is underneath that drip line of that tree. Because, you know, our trees are, are these beautiful specimens in many cases in our landscape, and they're, they're, they're absorbing the light. They're, they're hogging the sun, so to speak, and enjoying it, and the turf is, is not getting any. Uh, so moving the turf out uh, sometimes can help. Choosing a different species might help. Uh, choosing alternative plant material. And I'll, I'll have a slide on that a little later on. Hey, Probably not too many questions on the first slide here. I have a question yeah, about the zoysia. Sure. So you said there's been a move towards zoysia in Around yes. Here. Does the, is that because it's less fussy? Uh, is there a, a general reason for that? Demand. The demand has caused it. And this started back in 2007, 2008. If you were here those years in this area, you remember, uh, I yeah, mean, the worst drought they just had in 100 years in this area. I mean, we, ponds dry, trees were lost, but mm -hmm. certainly uh, all the attention in, in the media from from you all writing articles, et cetera, as, you know, the turf is dead, we need to be doing something different. And we started seeing a, uh, an uptick, the fact that warm season is more drought tolerant. Okay. Atlanta saw the same things a few years earlier. There was a time when you come to Atlanta, Georgia, most of the lawns were tall fescue. If you go into Atlanta now, uh, it's mostly warm season grasses. So it's interesting how a severe drought will make a shift. I do a sod, uh, sod survey every year of all of our sod growth, and actually it was posted uh, this morning on Turf Files. Um, and it's funny, because I, as I've talked to sod growers over the years, you know, before 07, 08, 70% of this area of sod growers' sales were cool season grass. And they will tell you today it's 30%. That's the kind of shift they've seen. So, and they're, they're they're trying to meet demand. I mean, they're not doing it because they want to grow something. And, and actually, um, from turning out around the farm, one of the reasons zoysia grass is so expensive is it's slow growing for a side grower. So they, they can't usually get a uh, planting to harvest in a year. It's going to take 18 months. So they're tying up land longer. So they're having to pass some of that cost on to the, to the consumer. So some of the other grasses, like tall fescue, they can seed it in the following year, harvest it within a year. They can't do that with zoysia. So that's one of the downsides from zoysia, certainly, is the cost. 
Uh, and we can talk about this later, but a lot of our warm season grasses uh, do not establish very well from seeds, and we're stuck with a vegetative establishment, which is something a lot of people don't like, but they're not used to it. So you mentioned trees. What about dogs? We ever have dogs in our Number one way to get exercise is walking your dog, right? So we, we, we know a lot of homeowners, a lot of you all have pets. And I'll be the first to admit that, you know, there are going to be challenges with pets that sometimes you're not going to be able to easily overcome. Now, the, the, the trick with wear and tear on a turf is have something that grows fast enough to compete with that wear and tear. So that's, that's, the, that's the name of the game. When we, when we do an athletic field turf, we're trying to produce a field that will grow quick enough that any damage it gets from Friday night, Saturday night, whenever they play on it every day, uh, it's continuing to grow fast enough to overcome that damage. It's the same process, thought process we use with an animal uh, pet, uh, particularly large dogs. Large dogs you know, like to be rambunctious in, in an area. So certainly, if you have a large dog, you know, a warm season grass which has good wear tolerance and also good recuperative potential and good growth, strong growth, just like our athletic fields or Bermuda grass, I mean, that would be the ideal. But what's, what's the catch? Shade. <laughs> you know, we'd love to grow Bermuda to handle all the wear and tear of the dog, but we're going to put it into a landscape with all these trees. And all of a sudden now we have a dog causing wear and we have shade that's preventing it from optimally growing and recovering. So it can then be a dismal failure on two fronts. You know, so, so the, the animal is just another stress that we have to somehow figure out how do we deal with this other stress now. So once again, you go back to what's the most limiting factor, often the most limiting factor in the landscape is shade. So we're going to have to address that first and foremost. The dog is going to be secondary in most cases. Now, if you live out in the country, you have no trees around your house, you don't grow warm season grass, Bermuda grass, and let the dog run, you're going to have a better performance than that. So, so we have these challenges. Uh, now, this, the second one also involves a dog. Now, with this dog coming inside and outside. Uh, so in that case, what's, what's often the issue? There's stuff stuck to the dog when they come inside, like rolling on the sofa. <laughs> it could be that. It could be debris coming in. And, and that's another reason people don't like warm season grasses, is in the wintertime, that senesce leaf material often sticks to the shoes and clothing gets tracked back in the house. Whereas fall fescue stays green and doesn't shed, shed, using a dog term here. Uh, so you don't get as much debris coming in. But really, the issue oftentimes with dogs coming in and out, they're going out to do one thing, and that is to relieve themselves somewhere in the landscape, and then they want to come back to the house, but it's not air conditioning. It's in the house, it's not outside. Uh, so then you have a lot of times urine spots on the lawn. And it's funny, one of the first times uh, I went to our chancellor's house, uh, I was called out there to look at all these spots in their backyard. And I walked in the backyard and said, well, y'all have at least one dog. And I said, oh, no, we have two. I said, yeah. Uh, <laughs> your dog is your problem. It's not a disease. You know, and it, it's very apparent to me very quick. And he thought he had a disease. Spot. I said, no, you could, you could track your dog's activity. Um, and the reality of it is, is, is we've looked at, there's a little bit of research on this, not a lot, but ironically, the the, uh, the urine, which is a, which is a, a salting uh, ammonium type of reaction on the turf, you would think something more salt tolerant would actually be better, but uh, the irony of it is that the Bermuda grass or oyster grass doesn't handle that urine very well. It will regrow and fill in enough sun, but actually fall fescue is one of the better grasses to deal with spotting. But ultimately, someone needs to train the dog into getting out of the yard probably or there are actually uh, pads that are sold that dogs can urinate, they just urinate on a pad, and things like that. So there's other commercially available things. Changing your dog's diet does not help. A lot of people think, well, I'm giving my dog good pills, good use of restroom, and that yeah, has never you know. worked. It's like a lot of other things that I've seen on TV, they don't work so well. Um, and I say I have a few bits of some of these as well. Um, I was actually at a lawn 
this tree was probably about three weeks ago in Quay Marina. And they had some issues, but while I was there, I was noticing that her fencing in her yard. And uh, what is that fence back there for? They said, oh, that's our dog run. And they actually moved into this house, had a square fence. And they knew those dogs, they had two really big German Shepherds. Because we knew from experience those dogs were just going to tear up our yard. So they added another fence along their entire back fence. It was maybe, maybe a little bit wider than meet to that wall there. And it was literally bare ground. But they could open one gate and open another gate, and it would be like a cattle shoot for the dogs <laughs> that area. And they'd close the gate, and then they had an area they could run back and forth, and they didn't tear up their yard. That is great. Should have taken a picture of it, I didn't. But, but they had that forethought that you know we know we got two big dogs. This just isn't going to work. So, so very interesting. Uh, best grass for lawn conversion. When you convert a lawn, uh, to be honest, there's a lot of different ways you can attack this. So I get a lot of calls. People call me and say, "Well, I have this grass. I'm going to convert it to something else. When should I do it? And what grass should I use?" So there's a lot of different questions along the way you may have to address. Uh, certainly, time of the year is a big issue of converting a lawn. Like, if you had a really bad winter and want to convert one now, I don't recommend people planting cool season grasses in the spring. Uh, seeding, you can get away with sodding if you're very careful and watch your water management and things like that. Uh, with seeding in the spring, even though you say, well, the temperature of the fall and the spring is about the same, I should be able to seed in the spring just like the fall. Uh, you know, a turf grass plant, like a lot of other plants, needs some level of maturity to handle stress. And the stress from June usually is more than a spring seeded plant can handle. Uh, so I tell people if you finish your construction of your dream home and you have to have a yard and you want tall fescue, by all means, seed it. But you better save some money because you're going to be reseeding in the fall, I guarantee you. Now, if you move further north, and I've heard a couple people say they moved here from somewhere else further north, if you're from New Jersey or Wisconsin or Michigan or somewhere, they actually recommend spring seeding. You know, because their summers are not as cool, particularly early summers, not as cool as ours can be. And that would be the preferred time because for them, the, the bone chilling cold can be a <coughs> factor in the winter. So they do spring seeding. So if you get on the internet and see all these people say, oh, you should be seeding your tall fescue in, in March and April, they're not from around here, I can tell you that. <laughs> Uh, so if you need to do that conversion in the, in the spring, you can do that, but you really you could you have much better success with sod if you had that real cool season grass in the springtime. Uh, otherwise, you don't have very many options. I mean, your, your, your time to, to really plant warm season grasses is now. So if you want a cool season grass, but you have to do it now, it, it's a really tough decision for people to make, and I try to educate them on the pros and cons. But certainly, if you start seeding tall fescue or bluegrasses right now, uh, most years, June ramps up so quickly, it will die. It will die by the end of June. Right. Will, will it be like 100% false or is it like 90% false? It, it can vary. It, okay. it, it can absolutely be 100% false. Okay. It, it could be 50% false, 40 or 50. So it, it will vary. A lot of it just depends on what the weather is like. And if we have a mild June, you might get away with it. But, I mean, we haven't had a mild June in a few years. Yeah. Quite a few years, actually. And usually, if you can get through June, uh, July and August are not as bad. It's that getting it out in March, April, May, getting about two to three months of growth. Uh, if you get through June, you usually can do okay. You can live through the rest of the summer. But, but June is usually the killer. Uh, so, making that decision can be tough for people. And I, I admit, I want a lot of people to do that thought process. Uh, where was I going to go with that? Cost wise, the cheapest way to establish turf is from seed, but we can't seed everything. And that's the one reason why some people want to do a conversion, and what they want to do, the easiest thing for a conversion would be to seed something. The reality of it is, is we can lay sod, particularly warm season grass sod, any month of the year. You know, we get a lot of calls. Oh, it's 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 uh, November, December. Can I sod Bermuda grass in my yard? Absolutely, you can do it. It's going to go down brown. It's not going to attack. 
and you can do it. And we have good success. There is actually some positives to putting sod down at the end of summer, early fall, because you don't have the water management issues you have if you put it in June or July or even you know, early August. Uh, so you know you can weigh those pros and cons. Throughout the bids, a lot of times sod or turf goes in in relation to a construction job, and that time we dictate when we're, we're going to put that in. But it is important to consider the ramifications when you're putting the grass in and what it may cause as far as struggle you may have for that time of the year. So, question? I know you're just talking about grasses, but I was working at the office a couple of weeks ago and a woman asked about white clover. I would turn her lawn into, I don't white know if you can address that, other than grass. I mean, she wanted to do that. Yeah. So. Uh, very interesting question. We actually have one trial right now in a research farm that uh, it's labeled a, actually we got two of them now, but we have a low input cool season grass trial, cool season trial, low input warm season trial, they're not just grasses. And in the cool season trial, we have some uh, micro clovers, some Dutch white clovers, uh, trying to think some of the other plants in there, some strawberry clover, uh, which is a micro clover, and a, um, ah, I can't think of the other one, I think I have a picture later. Uh, the problem with some of the clovers and some of the other plant material is they function like an annual in our environment. So they will grow and be pretty, they'll have good ground cover, be very attractive, uh, and at some point during the year they crash and then you have nothing. And that's why turf grass has such value in our landscape, is we can have something to hold the earth in place, prevent erosion and all that with a turf grass year round, and most of our other plant material does not give us that year round coverage. At some point it crashes. I mean, crabgrass, come on, can be pretty. I mean, we all hate crabgrass, we try to get it out of our yards, but if you mow it and it grows fast, you mow it frequent enough, it can be attractive. The problem with crabgrass is it's gonna crash and burn. First, it doesn't have to be a frost, you get about 50 degrees and it just melts, it goes away. And then you have bare ground, you know, to deal with. Uh, so the clovers, the best success for the clovers is to mix them with something else. So you'll get some clover in there, you'll get some grass. Uh, you have to appreciate that look. It's not a consistent monoculture, which a lot of us turf people have a tendency to like. Uh, but it can subsist with each other. You can get the bee habitats and things like that. But at some point the clover will kind of melt down. <clears throat> And the hope is that the, uh, and it should really be a cool season grass probably, but it could be a warm, uh, that other grass uh, will subsist during the time when the clover is not there. So, so we have, I don't have this off the top of my head, but we have some mixture rates we use in that study. That study's been there for four years. In four years, we irrigated it the first month we planted it. Uh, we fertilized it, I think, the second month it was out. It has not been irrigated, fertilized, or fungicided on it since. Does the decline of the clover provide any nutrition then to the turf grass? It should, yeah. <laughs> it should, in theory. Now, the interesting thing about clovers, I had a background in forages before I got into turf, and I, I, I've forgotten a lot of stuff from those days. But uh, I do know if you fertilize clovers, uh, it's actually not advantageous for the clovers to be fertilized. They will actually stop fixing nitrogen at the rate they would normally do. Uh, if you had not fertilized them. So there's there's some management techniques. And obviously, if you start mixing a broadleaf in the grass, you know, a lot of pest control is going to go out the window. You're not going to be able to do hardly anything because there's just no products that you can put on top of both of those in here in any way. So there are challenges if you want to keep it uniformly looking. It's more like an ecology experiment. You just kind of go with the flow and see what happens. And, uh, you may do a little hand roving of problem leaves or something. Kind of what we've done a little bit. Cheapest grass, from a sod perspective, I just looked at the, the data this morning. I, I wrote the article as I was looking at it in my truck because I actually saw a minor little mistake. Which I, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> the cheapest grass, from a sod perspective, is, is centipede grass. Um, so what did you say? Centipede Cent grass, from a sod perspective, you're buying sod. Now, I will be the first to tell you, I'm not a big fan of centipede. Centipede is a very quirky grass to manage. 
Um, just when you think you have the prettiest lawn in the neighborhood, for whatever reason, it starts declining. It doesn't like fertilizer, which for a lot of people, that's kind of cool. Um, but it's just a, it's a quirky grass. It has a few quirky disease issues, um, some drought issues. It likes to turn different colors sometimes. It'll turn red on you with cool temperatures. So it, it, it can be a beautiful grass. Some of the, the prettiest centipede grasses, if you go east of here, out in some of the rural areas, you'll see centipede lawns that have been there for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, they've probably never been fertilized, ever, and mowed very infrequently, and they'll look gorgeous. The worst looking centipede lawns are typically in a city, in a neighborhood, where you have mixed species in the neighborhood. So you'll have a lawn that's called fescue, centipede, Bermuda, zoysia. And invariably, the person with centipede wants to know why theirs is not as green as all of his neighbors. So he adds fertilizer to it, and next thing you know, it's going down that's usually what looks the worst. So it's a quirky grass. But the sod is the cheapest, the most expensive on the other scale is zoysia grass. Zoysia grass can be 50 cents a square foot delivered to your lawn. Uh, centipede grass is going to run uh, in the low 20s to mid 20s usually. Delivered maybe a little bit more expensive. Uh, it even has a separate category on the soil test. It does. Well, that's because of its acidity. Uh, zoysia grass handles uh, acid soils, actually prefers acid soils versus the other turf grasses a little bit better uh, at a higher pH. I will also tell you, this is not the subject that I had in, you know, in this talk, but, but the pH of turf grasses is extremely forgiving of a wild <coughs> We probably put a little bit too much emphasis on pH in our soil testing for turf grasses uh, compared to other plants in the landscape. I have, I have some pH on my property that's 4.9. Grass doesn't look too bad. I, I do need to mine it. I, I recognize that. Um, but it, it, it doesn't do too bad. I, I'd like to get it up you know, in the low fives at least. Um, and I came from a state you know, that's a, basically a calcined clay soil, which is close to Florida. And you know, pHs in Florida is usually 7.5 to 8. And those grasses can do pretty good. Now a lot of the other plants may suffer, but grasses are pretty, uh, pretty uh, forgiving. Another question I get a lot, it's a very interesting question for me, is can you ID a grass to the cultivar level? So what do you think the answer to that is? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You guys have already told us that there's still not a lot of difference in the summer cultivars. Yeah, well, in tall fescues, I don't think it probably could be done to cultivar level. So most of the warm season grasses, it probably can, but not visually. Uh, DNA testing has come a long way. In many cases, in many cases, it's starting to be used to, to identify. In case you're wrong, it's a crime. Well, that's what I tell people. I tell people that. Almost every time I get the phone call, and it's usually a phone call, sometimes it's a homeowner, hey, I had a construction, they damaged part of my yard, I need some sod to fill in this area, can you help me identify, they didn't even put the grass in, somebody else, the previous homeowner did. In that case, depending on which grass it is, I can usually get it close enough, I can tell them two or three different ones that would blend pretty well. May not be perfect, but convincing them pretty well. Uh, if it's somebody on a law case, then I say, yes, it can be done, but it's going to cost you. And the going rate is right now is typically about $1,000 a sample. For DNA sequencing? So, to do what? DNA. Yeah. DNA analysis. So it's not for the average homeowner to probably do, but when there's a course case involved, they're like, hey, where do we send the sample? You know? Uh, so, so just keep that in mind as you get that question. Can be done. It's not practical to do. The best, the best, uh, the best issue is, is you know, try to find something that will complement it or blend it. And I'll talk about some other techniques people can do with warm season grasses where they may not need to buy the sod and actually identify it at that level. Uh, let's get some pictures. We talked a lot about where it is. So you know, you go to a land, lawn landscape, and you're like, oh, I want a good looking lawn. <laughs> Not going to happen. Like, well, obviously you, you've uh, you've given up on it quite a while ago. Uh, you, you've got some mature trees. 
So you tell people, you know, you can take a few trees out, and you know, you can do that. So you know, before and after. Now, you have to be selective what trees you want to take out. Now, I have other pictures where people have taken out three acres of trees. Like, oh man, shocking. But you know, for some people it's worth it. For some people it may not be worth it. What's the timeline? Before and after. Uh, I mean, you could you could do that in a year. Sit my window. What time of the year should take out the trees and establish the draft? You could do that. Yeah, now he has to mow all the time. Do what? Now he has to mow all the time. Yeah, he has to mow. I mean, like, maybe, maybe the trees the kids up, let the dog run in a good place. place. Now, there's certainly alternative plant materials that look like grass. You know, yeah, bunch of grasses, variety of wood, variety of grass. Now, sometimes you get these in plugs and establish these. It's a slow route to get these up and growing, but you can do meat control and clean them up. But that can be whether it's a low growing type for stepping stones or here or taller. Or you know, you can do that as well. I found out in my yard deer love that stuff. They do. Yeah. Love that stuff. The rabbits. Yeah. Have rabbits. Yeah. Rabbits. Yeah. Uh, the deer. He is now the red. I didn't meet that. Instead of my so. letters. You know, here's a walkway that uh, they wanted a turf look, but obviously it's shady. Turf is not going to grow that area, so it's a good use oh, of that good. type of plant material. What is it? That's a nice crop. It's a mondo grass. Mondo grass. Mondo grass. Can mow it. But you, you don't have to. You don't have to. Yeah. You don't have to. It's it's a yeah, so so that, I'm glad y'all said that. You don't have to mow it, but you can mow it. Actually, I, had, I, I love to have a picture of this. I had a colleague of mine when I was at the University of Florida that had um, an area that had Confederate jasmine on his septic area, and it would get tall and bushy. So he wanted to mow it. And we're like, well, how can you mow it? Your mower, which won't go from somewhere about four inches high, you want to mow it like at six, seven inches. So he went to the uh, hardware store and got some big wheels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and then he went out and mowed it. Yes. Does he an engineer? No, he was a very scrap <laughs> uh, A few things not to buy. Don't, anything don't like that. Crap. Anything anything I've seen on TV. Yeah, I used to <laughs> love Bob Dylan. I lost a little respect with Bob. Yeah. 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 He needed the money. Uh, that is expensive stuff. Fifteen dollars for a, uh, a pound bag. You have to get a second one now. Back. You know, tall fescue seed is about three bucks a pound, so that's pretty expensive. Uh, if you look at the, this is the grass off. You may not be able to read it back there, but I'll, I'll read it through this really quickly. Creeping red fescue. That's a fine fescue. So that gives you some shade tolerance. Tall fescue. Perennial ryegrass. That's a low enough percentage. You may not totally dominate. But Ryegrass usually dominates uh, mixtures. Bunch of bluegrass, sheep's fescue, hard fescue, chewing fescue, other crops, uh, not very much. So that's like four sweeps out of seed, you know, storage facilities. Got a little air in there. And probably not very good cultivars. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard these stories too. Trees have the best looking background. You know, this homeowner was telling me this one day. This green. It's moss, mm -hmm. by the way. It's not turf. It's it looks moss. like pretty much. Pretty and looking shade. around, you see these trees. It's like, how many years ago was that? Yeah. 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 Well, we moved to the house, and that's been 15 years ago. And now their trees are big, and they have the shade. And beautiful flat area, great place to play. But you know, at some point, people have to come to grips with the fact that I don't have an environment. So I have a couple of choices. Uh, one of the which is to limb up trees, maybe remove a few select trees, and occasionally we can do some analysis and look at where some light could come from to remove a select tree here or there. Or you have to realize that we're just not going to have turf. We're going to have to mulch this, um, except moss in some cases. Moss would be attractive, uh, or other ground material or plant material, etc. So, but certainly grass will not grow everywhere. Uh, do you do you sell seed or sod? Now I get this question on. You may not get this question on. Maybe you do at a, at a, a place like this. You know, you're the Cooperative Extension Service in Durham County. Do you sell seed or sod? But I get this a lot because we have a research farm. People drive by. It's a beautiful lawn. They do sell grass. 
we do not sell grass. Uh, we research grasses, we help develop new grasses, but we do not sell grass. Uh, where to buy seed? You may say, well, that's kind of a stupid question. You can go anywhere and buy seed, can't you? And you can buy seed. Uh, retail outlets, uh, with the big box pipes, with like the Lowe's Home Depot, certainly sell a lot of seed. And I would say that they've gotten better at what they sell, but at the same time, uh, most all of our cool season grass seed now, I actually have the next slide I'll show you, is now coming as coated seed. So if you look at a seed label, 50% coated material. So 50% of that bag is seed, 50% of that bag is a coated material, coating. It's a clay, kaolinic clay type material, usually. It's not fungicide coated, this is actually a clay coated. Uh, so that, is, that has taken over the homeowner market, the retail outlet homeowner market, with coated seed. Now, not to, not to get into the weeds, so to speak, there is a, a little benefit to coating seed, but the reality of it is, is it costs the company a lot less to put the coating in the bag than it does to put seed in the bag. So there's a lot of marketing, a little bit of basis of that you know, benefit, but overwhelmingly the benefit is really not worth probably reducing that bag content to 50%. And the reality of it is, if you're reading uh, an extension publication that says you need to put out six pounds of seed per thousand square feet, What's your rate of this material going to be? Twice. 12 pounds per thousand. Yeah, you're only getting half. So all of a sudden, your money is not going too far in buying seed. The other thing is, is uh, Noxious Weeds, 87 rough bluegrasses per pound. That's over 1,700 rough bluegrass seed. Uh, and rough bluegrass is a relative to poa annual. We're seeing a lot of poa annual, annual bluegrass germinating on pounds, kind of ugly, generally. So this particular seed, actually, I wouldn't recommend people planting because that's a, that's a, a noxious weed that you don't have any selective control for right now. So where to buy seed? Uh, you can buy seed in a lot of places, but I would encourage people to certainly look at their label and make sure they're buying what they want. And in many cases, that's just seed. Uh, the, the, the outlets that sell <coughs> generate to the more commercial type uh, users. Uh, and, and, and at least in the Raleigh area, that's uh, Green Resources, Cyclone, Ewing, uh, that's pretty much the Green Resources, Cyclone, Ewing, Southern Seeds and Middle Sex, not too far from here. Uh, they sell primarily to commercial, but they'll, they'll sell to anybody that walks through the front. They'll sell you a 50 pound bag of seed, 60 pounds of seed. Uh, it's not a pretty bag, it doesn't have a picture of flowers in the front or not that you want to this is just a plain bag of seed. And in many cases, the contents of that bag are better cultivars than often you see in retail outlets too. And it's cheaper. That's the amazing thing is you can often get it cheaper per pound per million than you can get a low home seed. Now the downside, you said all these great things about buying there. What's the downside? The downside is the smallest container size they're going to sell you in a 50 pound bag of seed. Whereas you can go to Home Depot Lowe's and buy two pounds, five pounds. So if you don't need 50 pounds, you can be very wasteful going with them. But if you need 50 pounds and you can split it with a few neighbors or something, you can often do better. So I don't endorse places or things like that, or I try not to bash out places either, but there are certainly opportunities to buy seed cheaper, get more seed for your money uh, if you can use 50 pounds or more. So just kind of throw that out there. Uh, Seeding zoysia grass, you could add centipede grass to this question as well. But seeding zoysia grass, I tell people, and I stand by behind this because I've seen it too many times. I tell people the chance of success of seeding zoysia grass is about 20%. Are you willing to take that off, those odds? And to be honest, if you need a zoysia grass seed today, this year, I don't, I'm not sure you can find it. Uh, it's a very, very short supply. In fact, I, I've been looking around for some, so if you hear some that's available, let me know. We have a study. We need a little bit more. I'm going to actually probably call the farm that I know where they harvest it from and see if he has some. We can sweep off the floor or something. Uh, 
But in, in other years, it's relatively available. It's, it's expensive. It's not as expensive as sod, but it, it, from a seed cost, it, it's, it's expensive. Um, and it's just a very difficult seed to get it to germinate and get it to grow at the same time that crabgrass is germinating and growing. So it's, it's, it's not super competitive against the weed pressures and populations. And it's a very slow germinating plant. You know, you can, you can water ryegrass or tall fescue on this table several days in a row and get it to germinate. You know, three to five days just with water it would germinate. Um, you know, Bermuda grass is in that category too, usually 14 to 20 days before it germinates. That's a long time to have bare ground out there. So you know, it, it is a little bit of a challenge. Now, Bermuda grass, unlike Georgia, once it germinates, you can get it to grow fast. I mean, it, it jumps out of the ground and it wants to grow. It's just slow to get there and get started. So it's always in centipede. I used to tell people, particularly with centipede grass, also zoysia, figure at least two years before you have a full lawn. And in some cases, centipede may take three years because it's full and covered and dense. And if you can wait and be patient, uh, you can do it. And I have to tell you a story from yesterday. I get this little uh, thank you note uh, in my mailbox at the school. I'm looking at the name. The name sort of looked familiar. So I opened it up and I I was reading it. It was a picture of a dog on a lawn. It's a pretty lawn. And I was reading the note. It says, uh, we just want to thank you for helping us with a lawn last year. My wife quotes you often. Be patient. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a picture of our lawn this year. And it was a bit that I had done last year. So be patient. I tell people that a lot. It's, we often get impatient with our lawns. But patience can be pretty important. Uh, the other thing that people say is, well, you know, there's this great cultivar I've read about on the internet. It's uh, Tiffaway Bermuda grass. Where can I buy the seed? A lot of our warm seasons are hybrids, and hybrids do not produce viable seeds. So the only way to, to establish them is vegetation. You know, that can be a sprig, a plug, uh, or a sod, but they do not produce seed. A lot of people don't understand that. What do you mean they don't produce seed? Everything produces seed as a plant, right? But they do not produce viable seeds. It's kind of the old, uh, and I realize most of you probably don't have farm backgrounds, but the old farm analogy of a horse uh, and a donkey making a mule. That mule is sterile. It's not going to produce other mules. Only horses and donkeys produce mules. Uh, or, or hybrid corn. You, know, you can't collect corn seed from one harvest and plant it the next year. It's hybrid. It's got to be reproduced each year. So that's a, an issue a lot of people uh, don't realize or don't think about. Uh, certainly publications, uh, you know, and I brought some for you all that you can have later. Uh, but certainly our profile website, we have a lot of publications that can be downloaded and looked at. And if you haven't looked at those resources, I would encourage you uh, to look at those more later at the points. Uh, let's talk a little bit about weeds. Actually, I'll go forward. What weed is this? Elsie? Johnson Bay. And what I'm pointing at right here is this, 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 this. Well, what is a weed? It is a plant that's unwanted or under fire. So, so is, it a, is it also a grass that is unwanted in that location? It is a grass that's unwanted. Almost every location that grass is unwanted. <laughs> Crabgrass? So this is tall fescue. Beautiful tall fescue, and this is that Poa trivialis that I mentioned on that little seed label. Oh. It's, it's, it grows very fast. Wow. Uh, Does it have a common name? Uh, bluegrass. But most people know it as Poa trivialis, amazingly enough. It's one of the few grasses that people have. We're still not hearing that word well. Poa trivialis? Poa, P O A, Poa. We have Poa annua, annual bluegrass. Poa trivialis. E R I B I A L I S. Poa trivialis. And what's the difference between those two? Uh, Poa trivialis, this one is, is rhizomous. Uh, excuse me, stoloniferous. Uh, it's stoloniferous. It will spread. Poa annua uh, is strictly a, 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 a tillering grass that reproduces by seed. So it doesn't have any lateral stems. So that's more of a clump, right? It's a clump. 
poa annua is a fly. Now, uh, Kentucky bluegrass is also a poa uh, genus. You know, it's, it's, uh, they're all related. So we have, one of those grasses is desirable, Kentucky bluegrass, and then we have two poa species that are undesirable, poa annua and poa trivial. So poa pretensis is bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass is good. But this can be very problematic uh, in tall fescue. We don't have a way to selectively kill it and not kill the tall fescue. So it becomes a problem. And that's, that's kind of the lead-in of, uh, of the weed control is a lot of people just think that, oh, I have this weed, I should grab a bottle off the shelf, spray it on there, and our weed's gone. We, we have a number of weeds. I should say a number. We have several weeds that if you want to kill it, you can kill it, but you're going to kill whatever it sprays, anything around. We don't have selective removal of some of our weeds uh, in some cases, which is why it's important First off, to ID the weed. Know what weed you're, you're targeting. Uh, we have some weeds right now that are blooming, flowering, mm -hmm. or annual being one of them, that it would, it would not make any sense to spray a pesticide on those weeds. They're in, at the end of their life cycle. Mowing and heat are going to take them out, and then in you know, a few weeks to a month, you won't even see that they're there. So we have weeds like that. If you know what the weed is, you may say, wow. You know, it's, it's be patient. Once again, be patient, uh, and it will go away. We have other weeds that can be so problematic that if you want a nice looking lawn, you do need to provide some control. And they may be perennial weeds that cause perennial problems. Uh, when you think of something like the second one, crabgrass, we know we'll get crabgrass in a lot of our kirkgrass areas. We don't put out a pre-emergent product, uh, so. If, if it's important to have a mono stand and, and clear turf, then you know our advice is to <laughs> pre-emergent for crabgrass. If you don't mind crabgrass, then you don't put that out. And those are decisions people certainly have to make individually and personally, and I, I recognize that. Some people don't like to use pesticides because of uh, you know their children or pets, or just you know personally don't like them because of bees maybe, etc. Uh, but certainly, if you have uh, a desire for uniform turf, crabgrass is common, then a lot of people don't realize that pre-emergent has to be put out before it emerges, and for us that's usually late February to early March. And it's funny, our weed scientists who look at long-term climate change have basically said that what we would recommend today is about two weeks earlier than what they would have recommended 15, 20 plus years ago. I've always heard that the rule of thumb is when you see the percipient get a little yellow when it does when you put the pre emergent It can be too late. It can be too late. Actually, it can be too late. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen crabgrass emerge first week of March. For Cynthia if you look along for them that early. So and here's the here's the, the reality of putting out a pre emergent product. Most of our pesticides, not just pre emergent, most of our pesticides are broken down in the soil environment because of microbial activity. Microbial activity is very dependent upon temperature. So until the soil gets to a certain temperature, microbial activity is not very high. So if you put down a pre-emergent, say, the first week of February, the second week of February, you don't wait till that close to March time, it does not degrade any faster. Uh, it will still be as effective for about the same length of time as if you put it out later. So you're not causing problems. Uh, by doing it early. So it's actually better to be a little bit earlier than to be too late. Would you just put down a second application at some point in time, or you just wait? For season long control, usually the recommendation would be to put out a second application six to eight weeks after the first, and you usually can use half rates for the second application. You don't even need to use the full rate. And that's really just trying to get you through that July, August period where you can see a real flush of growth. You see a flush of growth and people say, well, I put out three, and you start asking them if usually they only put out one application. At the proper timing, it just played out, and all of a sudden that crabgrass you know, came up and emerged. So uh, late February to very early March. Some years, if you wait till March 15th, you're too late. 
And that used to be a recommendation was the first two weeks of March. Some, some years, you'll be okay. Some years, you'll be okay. The other thing is, like last year, we had to freeze in late March. It didn't kill the crab grass. A lot of people thought, well, I'm safe now, but we got a late March freeze, you know, last sure. year. And, you know, I'm just now putting out my freeze. I'm putting out the end of March. It didn't matter. The late freeze will not kill the crab grass. When did you say you Six to eight weeks after the first. So you're talking about right now. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Now there's all these nuances with turf that are related to species issues. But there's that centipede grass raising its head again. There's a lot of free products that we can put on turf grasses. And the most common ones are, are you know, there's common in trade names, but a lot of people think it's Verite, Dimension, and the uh, That's uh, premium. Those are uh, DNA types of herbicides. The centipede grass really does not like the traditional pre emergent products. It will actually, one, one of those problems that we have with centipedes is people who use those types of products. Uh, it may not damage them the first year, but use it by the second year, you start to use them. You'll see thinning of centipedes. Uh, the thing to remember with centipede grass is atrazine, and it's really the same as St. Augustine, but we don't have a lot of St. Augustine in this area, but, but atrazine would be the pre emergent choice. You wouldn't use atrazine on any of the other turf grasses, but you'd use it on centipede and St. Augustine. Do we have a lot of centipede? East of here we do. Okay. This general area, no. But you start heading east, you, you hit I-95 and head east, you'll see a lot of centipede. That becomes the, the dominant turf east of 95. Of states. Okay, Bermuda grass and tall fescue. Once again, we're trying to take a grass out of the grass. And to be honest, people say, can I take Bermuda grass out of tall fescue? Yes, we can do it, but there's two issues. One is uh, it's expensive, and two is you get on a program, you have to stick to the program. Uh, a lot of people see some success, and they thought, I've done it, they stopped the program, <coughs> if you do that, you'll be starting over. Uh, but you can do it. Our weed scientists have put together actually a very specific rate combination, but it's a combination of two products, which is Turflon, Turflon Ester, and a Claim Extra. Those kind of are tongue twisters. So Turflon Ester and a Claim Extra. Uh, and it's in our control guide, which you can grab if you want. But you have to do three applications a year for two years. So it's a June, July, August, June, July, August, two years in a row to have any success of hoping to kill Bermuda grass and tall fescue. And it's not, it's not cheap either. It's a, a very expensive application. So if you're calling a company to do this, some companies either say, we won't do it or we'll do it, but this is how much extra it's gonna cost you. And then customers may freak out, I'm not paying that. But they are expensive products, but it can be effectively done. We can actually uh, take Bermuda out of Zoysia as well, which is interesting because we have nothing to take Zoysia out of anything. But we can take Bermuda out of Zoysia, so that's kind of interesting. So, what's your reality? I've already mentioned um, our recommendation generally is either get a shovel yeah. or get some uh, glyphosate ground up products and kill it, and then you have to reseed or sod over that area. But uh, a, a, a shovel sometimes can be used extra. But then the issue is, I have a neighbor's yard who has warm season grass, I have a cool season grass, what am I to do? Because warm season grasses will creep. They either have a rhizome, which is a below ground stem, or they have a stolen, which is an above ground stem, or they have both. Zoysia and Bermuda has both. So that's our two worst ones. Uh, but St. Augustine and Centipede has above ground stem. So, really the only answer to that is, is uh, you need to become good friends and good neighbors and decide to share. So when his grass creeps, you're gonna share that, that creepiness. Or you're gonna have to build, you know, pardon the political uh, uh, kind of build a wall. Build, build a wall. And it's not only a wall, really not so much above ground, but it needs to be a wall below ground. You need, to, you need to build a, put a barrier between your, your yards. 
So the last couple of points is something I've experienced in the seat follow-up coming from a mile away from the user. <laughs> what, what is there anything you can do other than putting it on the wall? For POA? For POA. Uh, is it POA annual or POA trivialis? Probably POA annual, okay. right? Is seat heading right now? Mm -hmm. That's POA annual. Okay. Uh, you can actually put out a pre in the fall for that, because it, it germinates usually in like October. So you can put out a pre in September, or in some cases early October, and then you won't get it. Now the problem with doing a pre that time of year is you can't be seeding tall fescue. So if you're gonna seed tall fescue, you can't do it, but if you're not gonna be in a seeding mode, you can put out a pre and then you wouldn't get the, the POA annual. But a pre with a POA annual uh, for the Bermuda grass, that would work, right? Yeah, it worked with Bermuda, and we have good post control in Bermuda for POA annual. So once you get it, you can go out and remove it. But you don't have that tall fescue. So there's all these nuances with different grasses, and that, that's why it's, it's very interesting when you have a caller and they want to know how to control this or that. They say, all right, you have POA annual, just go out and put simazine on it. Whoa. That would be great if you had Bermuda grass, but if they had tall fescue, you just told them how to kill all their tall fescue. Yeah. So you have to know a little bit about what the grass is and what the weed is, and then match the products to those. And, and that's, I'll be quick to admit, that's challenging somehow. Even for me, who lives in that world. Uh, what, what are you doing on that website with this recommendation? Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, there's just so many combinations. Yeah, I, I did a lot of that. Did? Yeah. Or call Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to be yes, no. I did yesterday. Yeah. And, and actually, speaking of Bermuda grass and POA, if you have Bermuda grass and POA, and, and, and this is chasing a whole other rabbit if we want to do this, not, which I really don't. But if you have Bermuda grass in any winter weed, you can spray Roundup over Bermuda grass. And it doesn't kill it. It's, good, it's not good to spot spray it, but you can broadcast it. In the winter time, January, get a warm day, put Bermuda grass over, you can take out whatever you want, Bermuda will come out clean and healthy as can be. This is spot spay, spot spraying Roundup on zoysia grass in the winter time, and this is how it greens up. So you, even though the zoysia looks dormant, you cannot put Roundup over zoysia grass. You cannot do it. And actually the label says you can only do Bermuda. People get this idea that they can do zoysia as well. And that's how it looks. You can tell they had weeds along the, the mulched areas. They just kind of turned around and got a few in the lawn as well. So a lot of the references with pest control, uh, you know, comes out of these guides. Like I said, I have an 18 and a 19. Functionally, there's no difference other than the date on the front. Uh, I, I actually made the change. I entered the changes. I know what they are. They're not of any importance to 90. 8% of the people that would use that. So, so if you want to take an 18, that's fine as well. Uh, fertilizers. Oh, this has been pretty on time. You all know what the numbers on the bag mean, so I don't need to go over that. Yes. Uh, you know about soil test. We've already talked about pH. You know about the soil testing service, so I, I don't want to go over things you already know. So that's uh, this is mainly for was for agents, not maybe not so much yeah. for you all. Yeah. Uh, but I will I will make a comment to this: is anybody that's working in the public arena that spraying anything needs a pesticide license and by law. It's not just that you don't get a license, you need a pesticide license. If you are doing it as part of your job or you're getting paid to put out a pesticide, even Roundup, you need a license. Now, if you're doing it at your house personally, you're not paying yourself to do it, uh, you know, that's another thing. If you're doing it uh, as part of your job or you're getting paid, that is, that's important. Or you're spraying underneath somebody else's license who is aware that you're spraying underneath the license because they're going to be the person of the responsible. They're going to be the responsible party in the and I, I come into contact with schools in this situation. They always say, well, I'm spraying under the superintendent or so-and-so. I'm like, well, does he know that? You know, because if somebody gets hurt or sick, that's on them. Uh, any irrigation questions? Is there any irrigation questions? 
I have a, just a smattering of some miscellaneous topics. I didn't know. Um, a couple of points just to kind of breeze through irrigation or make, make you aware of things. Modern irrigation is much different than it was when we were all kids. Uh, of course, when I was a kid, you drug a hose around where you first, which could be pretty efficient if you paid attention. Uh, the modern irrigation, uh, the control systems are impressively amazing. Uh, the ability to, in this case, put your zip code in your controller and allow it to use information unique to your area is there and, and, and it works pretty well. Uh, so if you're in the market for irrigation or somebody calls you with irrigation questions, certainly encourage them to, to look into some of their options because they can save a lot of water with our new irrigation control system because they use either soil moisture sensors or an ET type sensor or a mini, mini weather station. And uh, by using that, it can really dial in and fine tune your irrigation application. So most all of your professional companies have a system, whether it's Toro or Hunter or uh, Rainbird, that they have available. Uh, that can be either retrofitted. If you have a modern controller, they can often be retrofitted. Or uh, in this case, this is an, a new controller that has some of this built into the controller. So a lot of options. In Durham, are you allowed to um, just hook that up to your hose and have like a drip irrigation? Or do you need a separate meter? I have that? no idea, but my guess is you're allowed. To. You're allowed to bring it directly, um, but there are restrictions on how much they can water if you're within the state limits. Yeah, Durham has rules. Um, it's, it's based on how I've worked with even numbers of households um, and no one's supposed to be doing watering on Monday. So yeah. you can just hook it up. But you can hand water as much as you want. But just a couple of Yeah, and that's just for the automatic irrigation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Systems. I've been associated with work for years, but when you're looking at 50 to 60 percent savings with some of these systems. So, uh, we do have several publications. Uh, I'm not even going to mention that right now. Uh, I'm sorry, where can we look up when you can water? It's on the city website, also in our most recent water bill thing, so we get that information. Yeah, that's where I saw it. Um, and I can send it. I have my Twitter handle. <coughs> <laughs> but it's as only for automated systems. Well, you can hand water as much as you want. Okay, never mind. So, Brady, can you tell us about watering your grass in our chat that I read? Should we see it? 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 That's that's an inch a week of water, not necessarily from irrigation, it could be from rainfall. Yeah, exactly. uh, what was the six to eight inches in the chat? That's, that's, that's the depth. depth. That's, that's the depth. depth. And so that uh, an inch will just about irrigate six inches of depth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't get that somewhere in the system. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And, and, and interesting, we've done work on irrigation. I've been in the city a lot of irrigation, so I could do, that could be a two day we could get into if we really wanted to chase that. Um, worst case scenario, heat of the summer, you know, turf will do best on about an inch per week, and that can be water or irrigation. There's a lot of months of the year that needs a lot less than that. So that's kind of like the, where it pops out at. But there are other months you can get by with as much less. Could I just throw this in about watering it? In, in Durham, it's actually more expensive than the sewage. Yes. Unless you, Unless you get a separate line. Unless you get a separate line. Now, when I moved into my house, I had a built in Rose 7. I could have gotten that meter for like $750, and I didn't do it. And I went down there like last year, and it, it's $3,000. And typically, it's the builder that will get yeah. it. Or he'll get the permit for like this or a second of land. But, but it's, it's, it's expensive for sure. Yeah. I my, my comment on irrigation from a homeowner perspective, take off my extension hat and just be a homeowner. Um, under our heavier soils, and not all of you have the heavier soils just there. I know my house, I do. It's, it's, a, it's a loamy soil, but it's got a lot of clay in it. Um, I might run an irrigation system three times a whole year. You just don't need to irrigate turf as much as most people think 
it's extremely resistant to drought in most cases. Uh, you'll see hot spots and things like that that you may want to take care of a little quicker, but after it's established, you have a decent turf, and if you take care of some cultural practice like aerification and things like that, it's extremely resistant to drought because of our heavier soil it holds a lot of water. Now, if you're in Florida where it's beach sand over a lot of state, I mean, you can get stress in a big half without water on turf. You know, and it's, it's challenging in that soil condition where your, your field capacity of your soil is 12%, where we're like 35 to 38%, you know, the water in our soil. So there's not a, a need for a lot of irrigation most years in turf grass. I have a question. Um, related to zoysia grass, when you Mm -hmm. Yeah. But with zoysia grass, do you need to do it carefully? Just say it carefully. Um, you know, because it could be damaged later. You can damage any of them if it's already in poor condition, but it's usually you're trying to alleviate a poor condition to make it stronger, so it's worth the risk of damage. Uh, Aerification for warm season grasses is, is probably not as paramount of importance it is for cool season grasses. We're in that renovation phase for a cool season grass. Uh, you know, I would rarely ever recommend a warm season grass being aerified more often than every two or three years. Um, and, and in some cases, you can stretch it out longer depending on what kind of traffic it's getting and how hard the soil may be compacted. But they're just hardier grasses to deal with that sort of Are we going to get questions about that? You probably will, just because people like to ask questions on that. Um, <laughs> my favorite one is to go to a high school athletic field and I say, well, I need to detach my field and stand on the 50 yard line. There's no grass to detach. <laughs> you know, but they read that you need to detach. Uh, that is largely a do you need it or do you not need it sort of question. And the zoysia grass is typically the older ones. We talk about the new ones and old ones. The older ones. We're a little more prone to being thatchy than some of the newer ones that were. And, and you get a lot of thatch, you get a lot of negatives associated with thatch, even with the zoysias, because you'll get elevated crowns, more likely to get winter kill. You get more disease, potential more insects, too, if they like to live in thatch. Uh, so you can have zoysia grass over some period of time uh, that really needs to be detached. But oftentimes, people can go years without detaching. What is thatch exactly? What is thatch? Yeah. It's partially decayed organic matter. Okay. It's like leaf material, leaf matter, stem material, roots that's partially decaying. And zoysia grass, the leaves don't break down as quickly uh, as like a tall fescue or a grass. They tend to stay on the surface a little bit more. So you can accumulate thatch on it in some cases a little bit quicker than you can some of the others. They just don't, it doesn't break down as much. So it's, it's got a lot of silica in it. Organic material that's in with the it's living grass. Yeah. How do you need thatch? How do you need thatch? Uh, what we call a vertical mower. So it literally goes in there and mechanically pulls it out. It, it produces a lot of biomass, too, to get to deal with. So I grew up in Florida, and of course we had tall grasses down there. I would never think about thatching the tall fescue that I have now. But that was, that's more the low-growing. Low yeah, dethatching is, is more of an issue with warm season grasses see. than it is with cool. Right. You can get thatch in a, a like a golf green bent grass, which is a cool season grass. It can be an issue, but most of our lawn cool season grasses, thatch is usually not an issue. Occasionally with bloom grass, creeping bent grass, it's just another species. We're not uh, going to talk about it. No, of bent grass. It's uh -huh. a totally different species. It's not in the book because it's not in the book. I know, I just haven't lawn. seen it, but there's so many in our neighborhood. I can't identify the lawn. Are you going to have the year in August to cover the grass again? Yes, we have a field day the second Wednesday of August every year. It's the same time, second Wednesday of August. This year, the second Wednesday is the 14th. So the, the date moves around, but it's always the second Wednesday. So it's as late as possible this year. What um, is this? What field? Second Wednesday of August is our field day. We usually have about 800 people, you know, come to our field day. So 
So we, we showcase a lot of our research plots and grass selections and things like that. State. At, it's at NC State. Uh, I may have a picture a little bit later on. Uh, actually, this is our, so this is uh, Lake Wheeler Road right here. Yeah. Tryon Road is right up here about where this white line is. Uh, so it's just south of the farmer's market. Yeah. So this is our research facility. It's about 35 acres. Uh, a lot of things going on there. So second Wednesday uh, of August. Um, just a couple other points. Uh, sod farm replacement, that will be up to whoever installed the sod farm. Uh, but that's a whole other issue to there. I, get, I, I tell people I get a dollar for every time I get asked this question. I wouldn't be working for it. But if you have a student who will come out and use my yard, test sites, <laughs> senior project. I get that question monthly. Seriously? Monthly. Yes. So, no, we don't have students to come out and use your yard. We have plenty of areas for them to use. Uh, will you come out and tell me what to do with my lawn? Uh, and I do some of that. Now, I cannot do every time somebody calls me, I can't. I have, I have other jobs to do. Uh, but I usually try to do it in support of our extension agents who maybe have an issue that they want another set of eyes. Uh, our professional managers uh, who look at a lot of lawns, obviously, the businesses, they have a particular problem they can't solve. Uh, golf courses, you know, the more professional people we try to be a little more responsive because there's fewer of them, and they're probably usually bigger in magnitude than, than the homeowners. Uh, but, but, and I'm more likely to do it if it's somewhere between my office and my house. You know? <laughs> uh, so I can be a little early to go by their house and go to my house. Uh, but certainly we want to be supportive of people and their issues. Like, and Lee Butler will address that when he's in here a little bit later this morning. A lot of times people can send me pictures. I can diagnose a lot of the pictures and the results. I don't necessarily have to get in a truck and drive you know, somewhere to help somebody. But certainly utilize your county people. You know, utilize them first as much as you can. Do you teach classes to us, us being you all and doing it right now? So yes, we do have events. We post those on our turf files, whether it's a field day, we have regional meetings and things like that. Those are usually posted uh, on our website. So. If you're looking for grass, uh, this is the Sod Producers Association, NC Spa. I love that name, Spa. <laughs> You know, the Sod Producers Association, but it's uh, ncsod.org is their website, ncsod.org. It's a place to go to find particular grasses, particularly warm season grasses. There's a lot more diversity in the warm season cultivars than the cool season. So a lot of times people want a particular cultivar of warm. You know, for instance, we grow 12 different cultivars of zoysia grass in the state of North Carolina. Because I pulled, I pulled them all. I found that out. Uh, 12 different zoysia grass cultivars. So if you want a particular one, you can go to this website. You can type in zoysia grass here. And a drop down menu would show you all the cultivars. And they have the sale. You can click on it and it will show you who has that grass. You can also go to a, a, a county, click on a county, and it will list the sod growers in that county. But realize that sod growers are very accustomed to trucking. Uh, to them, typically, a, a range that they're accustomed to trucking in is about 100 miles. So you think 100 miles, that's a pretty good ways. But, but that's a typical range most of their trucks are leaving their farms and going into city centers and urban areas and things like that. So if you don't have a sod farm in your county, there might be one of another county that supplies your county. Don't let the county get to, uh, scare you away. Uh, as I mentioned, we do a lot of trialing, a lot of tests, and this is just all the grasses and trials that we have currently going right now. Uh, all of these uh, INTEF trials, which stand for National Turf Grass Evaluation Program, National Turf Grass, uh, the date is when they were planted, and they're five year trials. So this particular trial, Bermuda and Zoya, ended in 18. Bermuda in probably July of this year. So, and then that trial that we did in 19 will have for five years. So, you can see when these come and go, they're, they're kind of staggered so that we're not tearing everything out and replacing it all in the same year. So, they're staggered over a long period of time. Um, so, anyway, it's called 
throw that out there. And they're all over our farm. We have different ones. This is actually uh, Georgia and Bermuda right here. So these will be coming out uh, this year. Actually, I hope they're coming out today. But I'm not sure they are. And actually, some people come by. We'll be out there doing something like, "What are you gonna do with that grass? <laughs> Sell it? Give it away?" Uh, so, with the research you guys are doing, how often do you guys make new appliances? Is it like basically every five years, or how fast are those things changing? How how fast are those cultivars changing? Yeah. Uh, this whole area right here, in this yellow box, is our plant breeding area. So we have a turf breeder who is developing new grasses, and then these plots don't do it justice. There, there might be, you know, six or eight hundred different crosses in one of these little plots. Um, our plant breeder is relatively new. She figures, and, and the current cycle of developing new grasses is about 10 years. So she hasn't been there 10 years yet. Uh, she actually has a fall fescue that came out last year. It's not widely available yet. We hope to release a St. Augustine grass maybe next year. Bermudas and Zoysias were probably a little further away. But there's other states that have plant breeders that are also feeding our market as well. Uh, Tiff Tough is a relatively new grass. You may have seen advertisements for it. Uh, it's a Bermuda grass. Um, we did a lot of the original testing for that grass for Georgia. But it's, a, it's a Georgia grass, but it's quickly becoming the dominant grass sold in North Carolina. It's in two years, so it's been very successful. Uh, it's hard to predict how often they'll change. I mean, some species, the change is more rapid. Centipede grass hasn't changed hardly any in 50 years. Bermuda grasses have changed a lot in the last five. So it will depend a little bit on the market. Uh, we put a lot of data on this website, but it's, it's a data website. It's not a picture sort of thing. It's, uh, all of our testing data goes to this website. And a lot of other states put all of theirs on this website. So it's a USDA maintained website. So we use it to uh, house all of our data. A lot of this, the seed companies and other people use this website to help decide whether to release a grass or not. So I had this point earlier on. You know, I get this question sometimes. I moved into a house. I don't know what grass I have. We built the patio. We damaged a big area. I want to put that grass back, but I don't know what it is. And a lot, the nice thing about warm season grasses is they do spread. If you're patient, uh, you can take plugs from it or chunks of it with a shovel, put it around, and in time it will spread and it will fill. And this is basically a picture. I, I actually have a better version of this device that I bought. It's called a Miltona plugger. And it's better because it's got big foot stirrups. That was size 13 foot. I, I could never get my little big foot on that little ring around the bottom. But I have a big foot stirrup one and a big handle. And what it does is you jab it down into a a nice area and it accumulates the plugs in the handle and you just dump those and they all fall out. So you put about 18 plugs in the handle. So you can very quickly go through there, collect a bunch, and then plug an area and, and reestablish it. Um, I like to tell the story. I don't think I have pictures in this presentation, but when I built a new house in almost six years ago now, one of the first things I did is I put grass, uh, basically a pallet over my septic area. And then I, I bought a grass I really wanted. And then from that 500 square feet, I took plugs. And I've expanded it over 20,000 square feet. So 500 square foot investment has turned into a 20,000 square feet lawn just by doing this exercise right here. And in three years, it's 98% filled. Does it grow quickly? No, it doesn't. I mean, you can take a plug, but it doesn't spread. They don't grow. They don't creep. It would stay. It would stay a, a clump, probably. Right <laughs> but, but yeah, you can see. Well, this is one. Notice this shady area, not spreading so much. Sunny area, oh, it's yeah. spreading. So you know, here's where environment is making a huge difference on establishment rate. So you may want to put those closer together or saw in that area, but you know, most people want to do it in that area. So what is your lawn? That's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the one with the plugs. The one with the plugs. No, I actually, mine's a little bit different than that. But that's actually, well, I think that picture is St. Augustine at the bottom, but that's the Georgia at the top. 
Um, around my, I bought a piece of property, so I have a larger than average farm. I mow about two acres. Oh. Um, I put zoysia right around my house, and then I put some seeded Bermuda, an improved hybrid seed, uh, in front, and then I have a uh, another Bermuda on the side with my septic area, and then I expanded that. I have a a grove area that I have Kentucky bluegrass in, which is really beautiful. Then around the front edge, I have some vine fescue, and then a little bit of tall fescue in the back. You, I you're out. You're out. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a test site. Don't have to grass <laughs> grow. It's a lot of fun, though. You're a grass nerd. You're good with that. Yeah, I am a grass nerd. And it's funny, my colleagues, I've been on, I've been on a program like four or five turf people in the same program. And it's interesting to hear them saying, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I do grass all day long. I go home, I don't want to deal with grass. I pay somebody to mow my grass, to spray my grass. And I look at them and say, y'all are crazy, you know. I want to go home and be in my, in my yard, you know. So I'm, I'm a little bit different than some of the rest of them. But, yeah. Anyway, it's fun. Uh, turf files, I know you've all been to probably turf files. I just wanted to send it up there as a reminder. Uh, and that's where we make our announcements. It looks a little different now. We're in the extension portal, so that page is up there now and looks a little bit different than that particular page. I think that screenshot has changed. Certainly go to turf files. There's a place where you can sign up for alerts. And like I said, now all of this stuff right here is in a, a red box on the side. But go over to where it says alerts over on the side and sign up for alerts so you'll get announcements for events and things like that. We don't, we don't bombard you with emails. We do send some things to you. Uh, so I thought I'd mention that. Uh, certainly the diagnostic issue, I really don't want to cover because you're going to get a lot of that from me. And uh, when I put this talk together, uh, I did not know Lee would be right behind me. So I, I did have some diagnostic stuff in there. But this is a very interesting picture. This is actually at ECU University. We are talking to ECU graduates. Uh, but that's on their practice athletic fields. And that's spring dead spot on the right. And that's a perfect looking field on the left. No fungicides are sprayed on either one. If you say, well, why is there a spring dead spot in one spot and not the other? This area was terrified, and this area is compacted. So a cultural practice basically controls that very problem to the So it's not all about chemicals in many cases. It's having good cultural practice. In many cases, can you know alleviate certain certain issues, certain problems. So that's that's a good slide to show. And certainly, uh, you know, a lot of turf issues. You're going to have to get down the turf and look at it. This is actually a former student of mine. This is chinch bug. We don't have a lot of chinch bug problems in North Carolina. This was in Florida. And that's Lee Butler right down the bottom. He hasn't walked in yet, but that's what he looks like. <laughs> He'll be talking to you. They have a great website. They even show you videos of how to collect samples and how to submit them and stuff like that. So we'll talk to you about diseases and stuff. These are just a few screenshots <coughs> from uh, turf files. In many cases, uh, it is very picture oriented. So if you go to the weed section, you don't see this, and there's probably a hundred weeds down here. You can click on them, and a lot of pictures can go through and help you ID those, et cetera. So if you haven't looked at that, certainly look at it. Uh, this is the one of the insect sections. These are all insect pests, uh, and a lot of you know, obviously publications, et cetera. We don't have apps anymore. I need to actually replace some of these screenshots because we have changed some of these things, uh, but we don't use apps. Um, Looks like fertilizer, these are ground pearls. And this is something else we see in the eastern part of the state. Fayetteville area has a problem with ground pearls, and then the Bloomington area has a problem. Not so much this area. It's a scale insect, uh, ironically. It's a scale insect in the soil. We have really no pesticides to control it. So you is have that to grow grass stage, fast enough stage? to overcome the damage. Is that Very the, big problem. That's not the adult, is it? Uh, that is the adult. Oh, it is. Well, yeah. The nymph is a pink looking little nymph. You know. <laughs> ugly little, ugly little nymph. Ugly little yeah. adult. Yeah. Yeah. Disgusting little yeah. 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 uh, This is actually an interesting turf problem. You may not see this. It's thin turf, but all that is earthworm castings. 
Mm. And as we've gone to safer and safer insecticides, our old insecticides used to kill a lot of earthworms. Our new ones don't touch earthworms. So earthworms can actually build high enough population, they can cause turf damage. Wow. So there are a few cases that people call us, how do you control earthworms? Well, there's not a chemical yeah. label for earthworms you know, out there. Why are castings bothering the grass? Just too much? Just too much. Okay. It loosens the soil so much. I mean, it, it's not common, but in case you have like golf greens, which is what we usually see as a problem, sure. they get so much on a golf green that it's killing turf on the golf green. There's actually a couple of fertilizers that have organic components that uh, reduce earthworm population. And actually, one of them is called uh, early bird. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of miscellaneous, my last several slides here. I get this question, what's the best mower to use? Uh, and there's about four different kinds of mower operations and how they use. Uh, this first mower is what we call a real mower, R-E-E-L mower, not an R-E-A-L, they're all real. Mm -hmm. This one's got two E's in them. Uh, a real mower has basically two blades. It has a blade here and then a, what we call a bed knife. So as that blade rotates around, it hits the bed knife and it basically cuts with scissors, like a scissor action. Those are very effective for particularly low mowed turf uh, that's very uniform. Think golf greens, fairways, athletic fields. We use them some in landscape, but not a lot. They're a much higher maintenance mower. Uh, so most people would not want to maintain a real mower. Uh, the, the traditional impact style this is obviously a small one. Most all of our turf grasses can be mowed, you know, quite acceptably with a, with a uh, impact style mower, a rotary mower, we call it. We do have flail mowers, and these are mowers. These are actually a lot of blades on a on a, a long axle that spins. So they're loosely attached to it. You can see they're just kind of flopping around. But as that thing starts spinning, it kind of moves on the outside through centrifugal force. And then it mows and it throws everything underneath a shroud so it doesn't have a discharge. And if one of these blades hits a rock or a root or something like that, it just folds over. So they're very safe to use around buildings. Uh, a flail, F-L-A-I-L, flail mower. Uh, they're typically used in kind of industrial situations where you're mowing around highways and buildings uh, in urban areas. Uh, their quality of cut is not great with these. And they are a bit of maintenance, uh, but they're usually behind a pretty big tractor, you know, tractor types. Uh, I don't see them as much as I used to. They kind of ebb and flow the popularity of flail mowers, but, but uh, they can be very beneficial if you have a lot of windows around the building. You don't want to throw anything out of the side discharges. And certainly a weed whacker, weed trimmer, line trimmer. Uh, it's basically something like this, only it's got a, a string. Now these can all be somewhat damaging to turf. Um, or to keep blades sharp. Obviously there's no blade here, but to keep blades sharp and balanced and things like that. But I guess the biggest question I often get, and it's something I actually took out of that manual in the second edition. There was a comment about zoysia grass should be mowed ideally with a real mower. That sentence has been removed because no one really uses uh, real mowers that much in landscape. And it, you really don't now, can you get a better quality of cut with the real mower? Yes, you can, but it's, it's not practical. So just kind of want to throw that in. We have actually done mower studies. Is he <coughs> quick on me? No, yeah. but we have, I got the, the book from Oh, okay. <laughs> time, this is time for break. Give me, give me another two minutes. Uh, I just wanted to point out that we were testing mowers. This is a half inch mower with the same mower than right here. It's amazing how mower setup can change quality of cut. I mean, we tested about 48 different mowers over a couple of years. It's pretty, pretty amazing what you can do. Uh, we use this slide a lot in the influence of crabgrass and tall fescue. We did trials with one, two, three, and four inch mowing heights. And these bars represent the percent of crabgrass in fescue, everything else being the same but mowing height. One inch height, almost 80%, two inch height, 74, and three, 30 and a four inch virtually no crab grass. And I really want to say this because if there's one thing you can tell your people on the phone is raise your mowing height. 
does so much for health of the grass and reducing uh, weeds, particularly tall fescue. On warm season grasses, we don't get the same sort of benefit. This is a tall fescue study. Actually, at lower mowing heights, Bermuda in particular can be more competitive with weeds sometimes at lower mowing heights, but with tall fescue, raise, raise your heart. You can paint grass green. <laughs> if you don't like brown grass, there's a lot of great turf pigments and products out there to paint grass green. Oh, I'm dead serious. You can do it other colors. Make it if, if you're a if you're a football fan and watch TV in the fall, I promise you that field has been painted. High definition television requires it. <laughs> television technology has has caused that. <laughs> Mowing. mowing patterns. This was actually won a contest of mowing patterns two years ago. So people get pretty ingenious with those. Uh, certainly my contact information. So I know y'all need some snacks. and Do they have snacks in here or out there? Come back. Out here. You need snacks too. Okay, I'm around if you want to converse with me, but certainly you'll get your snacks. <laughs> Thank you.